Everybody. It's almost time to lift the curtain on the Jim Harbaugh-led Michigan Wolverines. And once it's up, what sort of a product will it reveal? Adam Biggers, the assistant sports editor of Today's View at FanRank Sports, stopped by on Friday to chat about expectations for the maze and blue. So Adam, uh, we welcome you uh, back to the Dramatic Advantage podcast. Thanks uh, for your time this a- afternoon and thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me again, Kevin. It was fun last time. Looking forward to uh, another fun time today. So uh, as we know, uh, Coach Harbaugh said that uh, the team was going into a submarine to get ready for the season. So can you tell me uh, what you think uh, they accomplished during uh, fall camp and what do you think Michigan football will look like after they come out of the submarine period on uh, Thursday of next week? Well, I, I would say technically they're they're probably out of the submarine now. They've been available to us all week. Uh, Kyle Kalis talked about it. He said it, it would be something that he told his children about, you know, down the road. Uh, m- most of the guys I've talked I mean, DJ Durkin said it was uh, uniquely different than anything that he's ever experienced. He's the defensive coordinator. This is his first go-round with, with Harbaugh. Tim Drevno, on the other hand, the offensive coordinator, said that he's pretty familiar with this. Um, the, he talks about how it's basically meant – you know, for the players to bond. And I think that that's what they did. They went into that bunker mentality. We hear, heard that phrase tossed around a lot. And they just got together. They, you know, they talked about things. And, and really what struck me, Kevin, was that Kyle Kalis mentioned that Tim Drevno had taught the offensive linemen things that they had never knew existed. And for a player such as Kalis, he's a, he's a redshirt junior, to say that he's just learning some of these techniques, that kind of blew me away because – I would expect someone, you know, at his age and his rank um, on the team to, to maybe know those type of things. So it really sounds like there's going to be improvement, real improvement on the offensive line. And I think that that's probably one of the position units that, that benefited the most, you know, from being submerged with uh, Captain Harbaugh. And the coaching change. Absolutely. <laughs> now, when we look at uh, quarterbacks, uh, uh, Jim hasn't named a starter yet, but uh, – all indications are it's between Morris and Rudolph. So to the best of your ability, could you give us an update on uh, the quarterback situation at Michigan? Well, no more tonight um, at availability, but if I, I've been saying, and I think a lot of people have been saying, Kevin, I, I believe it's Jake Rudock. I have I've long believed it was Jake Rudock. I think when he took all first team reps at that practice last Saturday, that was kind of, uh, Tim Drevno says it wasn't an indication. I asked him about it. And, of course, they're going to say no. Uh, I do believe that it's Jake Rudock. Uh, the, the, uh, Harbaugh said that the team plans to announce Monday by trading depth charts. And I, and I guess maybe not announce. He just said that they would trade depth charts. I'm assuming that it will be announced, made public, who the, who the starting quarterback will be. But I'm 99.9999 all the way, Jake Rudock. I would, be, uh, I would be shocked if he is not the starter. I don't believe. And uh, I think I mentioned this last time, Kevin, when we talked. I don't believe that he transferred from Iowa to, to uh, gamble his final year of eligibility. I think that he's got something going. Jed Fish recruited him in the past. He's got relationships. He takes care of the ball. That's something major that they're looking for. He only th- he uh, had the fewest interceptions last year. Uh, I believe it was five or six, five uh, of any Big Ten starter. And I think that that's a glaring stat that they love, and uh, especially Drevno and, and Jed Fish. So I do believe it'll be uh, it will be Jake Rudock, Kevin. Now, traditionally on offense, uh, Harbaugh likes to use multiple tight ends and a running back system by committee. And with the depth Michigan has at running running back, do you see this being a tight end heavy offense, or how do you? Uh, um, expect Michigan to run their offense this year. I I think we're we're going to see the the reemergence of the tight end position at Michigan, Kevin. If you look back, you know, not even, you know, five, seven, eight years ago, I remember in the '90s, you know, guys like Tuman and early 2000s, 
that that position it hasn't been lost at Michigan, but it just seems maybe it's gone underutilized. Jake Butt, fully healthy, he told me on media day that he feels better than uh, he he thought he was 100 percent, but then he realized he wasn't because he really knows now what 100 percent feels like. If that makes any sense, so he feels great. I think uh, the moves with Chase Winovich to tight end, um, Henry Pogi or Pogi rather, um, th that brings in a little bit of a blocking mix. Jake's probably the athletic playmaker guy. They're going to have different roles for different guys. Um, we could see them, you know, use the two tight ends in a set. I don't know. The, the, power, the return to power football, Kevin, I think is, is pretty imminent here. And you look at, at the running back, I, I don't even think really maybe running back depth is something that we should really break down a lot. It's going to be but the fullback depth. I think the fullbacks are going to get some carries. And we look at Joe Carriage and Wyatt Shawman and Sione Huma. I think those guys are going to get touches this year. But I, I think it's uh, – Harbaugh said yesterday – that they were basically, the roles have been defined. He wasn't going to give anything away. I tried to get something out of him. It didn't work. But basically, they know who's going to do what. They're just not saying anything. And I think, um, you know, if I had to take a guess, I, ha I have to believe that Davion and Derek are right there at number one, you know, 1A, 1B. That's, that's kind of my feeling from what I heard um, from the practice. I was not, you know, the media was, was not available or uh, – eligible, I should say, to, to attend that practice. But there were some um, reporters and uh, also, coincidentally, Michigan students that I had talked to who told me that uh, Davion had just as many carries and vice versa as Derek Green. So, the, the, you know, those guys appear as the number one guys, um, according to what I have been told. Now, when we look at the overall all team on defense, I know you had a chance to talk to uh, – Greg Madison, the former defensive coordinator, now the defensive line coach uh, for Harbaugh. He had mentioned during the interview that he was excited to see where this group, uh, particularly the defensive line, is going to go because of the amount of time that he invested in, in molding that group. So can you just tell me what you took away from Media Day as a whole and your uh, conversation with uh, Coach Madison. Well, I think Media Day, the, the feeling was, you know, optimism going into the submarine. You know, Jim Harbaugh said then uh, he looked over to uh, the football SID, Dave Obloff, and, and he's an associate athletic director as well, and he said, Dave, I don't know what you have planned for me you know, for the next couple of weeks, but you guys aren't going to see me, you know, and he was talking about everyone in tennis, media members, and so that was kind of, that gave us an indicator, and they, they were, what, they were under four, I believe it was like 18 days, something like that, so um, we look, basically my feeling from media day is that they accomplished the mission, after now talking to them, now that they're, you know, um, done with fall camp, it feels like everything that they talked about doing prior, they were able to accomplish. At least that's what I'm led to believe. As far as Greg Madison, it, you know, it was a great pleasure to be able to sit down with Greg. He's one of the finest defensive minds in the game. He's a dedicated coach. His energy level is just unparalleled. Uh, you know, I talked to Ta Taco Charlton, and he's an energetic guy. And if Taco Charlton says that the team strives to match Greg's energy, then you know that Greg Madison has something special. And I, I really believe that he is, you know, the reason – why this uh, defensive line is what it is. It's going to be without Brian Monet, but there's a lot of depth there. And, and Kevin, I'll tell you, he rec he's recruited well. He's developed well. There are, you know, Maurice Hurst is going to get some reps. We're going to see others, you know, don't forget about guys like Matt Godin. You know, there's going to be guys who step in, fill some roles. And I, I do believe Chris Wormley and the rest of Willie Henry, that defensive line is going to be a strength of that defense this season. Now, when we look in the secondary, obviously, uh, Peppers' versatility will be a strength for them. Where do you see uh, Peppers uh, eventually playing? Uh, how important is his development to the overall uh, success of this year's defense? Well, when Jabril's not uh, playing quarterback and wide receiver and running back because the the, he's, he will get snaps on offense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go ahead and say that Jim Harbaugh kind of danced around the possibility of it. They've hinted at it, and then he's kind of backtracked a little bit. 
and said, yeah, well, maybe it is a possibility. We've talked about it. I think Jabril, you know, he's, he's going to get touches everywhere. But uh, in all seriousness, as far as the secondary is concerned, uh, he's bounced around. Nickel, corner, you know, he's playing safety. He's just so athletic, Kevin. You can put him really back there anywhere, and he could do something. I mean, Jabril could play, at, you know, in certain packages, uh, an outside linebacker. He's just so incredibly uh, quick and athletic. He can really do everything. So I, I think that he's going to start. He's he's going to wow. He's he's as advertised through camp. Harbaugh said it. Everybody said it. I mean, um, it, it's one thing when you enter in with the hype last year and people had seen you, and, and yeah, that, that's great. But then you, he comes back from an injury, and people are still saying the same exact thing about him. So I, I have to believe in it, and I think this is going to be a huge season for Jabril. Now, in terms of five things to watch when we transition into uh, the fir first game at Utah. What are some things that you'll be keeping an eye on to see how much progress has been made? Well, I mean, there's probably, there are probably more than five things, honestly. I, but just the things that come off, you know, the, the top of my head. And uh, I've talked about this a lot, uh, Kevin, the elevation. And I mentioned this to Sione Huma. He's from Salt Lake City. He said his teammates had talked to him a little bit about it. Uh, Durkin said that they had talked a little bit about it. It doesn't seem like it's going to be a big issue, but there is a 3,000 feet on average difference. So I think that that could come into play. You have to realize, you know, the thinner air, the environment as well, too. Kevin, I've done a lot of Google map searching. I really like maps. And I've looked around, and there's the Tomahawk Natural Area, and there's uh, another, I'm, I'm forgetting, I want to say Red Butte maybe, and it's surrounded by mountains, and it's in the desert, and it's just got, you know, Guardian Mountains. It is not a welcome place for the Wolverines to play. I think this is going to be uh, a very dangerous game as far as going on the road in this type of environment. I think Utah actually will win this game. So, uh, But I think Michigan's got to watch out for Travis Wilson, the youth quarterback. The guy can run. He may not light you up with all kinds of yards, but he's incredibly tough. Uh, he's instinctual. And just look at his look at his highlights. You know, pull him up on YouTube. The guy really sacrifices his body for six points. I mean, he's he's not afraid to dive. He's not afraid to you know jump the pile. So I think uh, he's going to be a big factor. Devontae Booker, the running back for Utah, I think he he'll be a factor too. And I'm really just you know I want to see how the secondary response. Kevin, last year we saw Bubba Pool three catches, you know, 75 yards. Uh, you know, the majority of it on that big catch that he was stopped by Jordan Lewis, but Utah was able, was able to throw the ball around a little bit last year. I'm de, I just want to see how much you know tighter the secondary is going to be. And again, I can't stress how important it is on the road for these guys. This this is the ultimate test. It's Harbaugh's first game. This is historic for Michigan. This is one of the biggest games in Michigan football history. And I think really if they win, it's going to be trumped up as such. If they lose, maybe you know Michigan fans will well eh, maybe it's not that important. Don't. Don't be fooled, Kevin. This game is hugely important, and uh, people are people are anticipating this. Like it's, I mean, it, the environment is so much. The the feel is so much more than a season opener. It really is. Now you bring up an important point uh, in terms of, of if Michigan loses this game, or even if they win it, it'll be interpreted in so many different ways. So with that in mind, regardless of the result on our next th th Thursday, how uh, do you think uh, success in Harbaugh's first season uh, should be measured? Well, he's got to see the effort. The effort's got to be there. And, and you know, the, we've heard a lot about the questioning and uh, were these guys entitled and how come you know, the, the culture change, and all that's very much easy for people that aren't there every day to talk about. Now, we, we know some of the things that have been more widely reported on, but, I mean, only the players and the coaches truly know the day-to-day -day and, and the culture. You know, there's people we can know as much as we know, but the people who really know it are the ones living it. And if, if, if those indications are true, the, the positive attitude is just the difference, I guess, the way guys sound. But, I mean, they sounded like this last year, too. I, you got to see the effort on the field. I don't think that the effort was there all the time last year. I think there are few and far between players. They need a lot more guys like Joe Bolden, who is going to get fired up for a big rivalry game. Um, you know, you get you got to have more guys making plays on um, offensively. 
you know, you don't have Devin Funches anymore. I mean, Jake Butt's going to be very important. And I think anything record-wise better than 5-7 and seven is an improvement. But if you want to even say this game specifically, win, lose, or draw, as long as Jim Harbaugh is satisfied with the effort that he sees on September 3rd, then that's a win, I think, either way you cut it for Michigan. Now, when we look at the overall Big Ten, what do you think Michigan stacks up within the conference? There, it, Michigan's got a ways to go. And, you know, we, we're hearing people, to, I think it was Trent Clatt of Fox Sports, he's saying, you know, Jim Harbaugh is the best coach in the Big Ten. And, and hey, Jim Harbaugh is a great coach. Yes, he has won everywhere he has been. There's no denying that. He hasn't coached one game at Michigan, though. So I think that's where people have to kind of slow the roll a little bit, adjust the tempo, let him coach in the Big Ten before you start counting him the best coach in the Big Ten. It's a different league, okay? If, if Urban Meyer went to the NFL, are you going to say he's one of the best coaches in the NFL? Well, maybe coaching minds, but let him coach at the NFL level to see what he could do before we start talking about that. So with that said, if you just coaching-wise what he knows, yeah, Jim Harbaugh is up there. But in terms of pecking order where Michigan is in the Big Ten, uh, Michigan's nowhere near where Michigan State is. Michigan's nowhere near Ohio State. I mean, Minnesota's on the uptick. I mean, I would argue that Minnesota seems like it's in a better position, at least this year, to win than Michigan is. So Michigan has a ways to go. I, I don't think a, you know competing for a Big Ten uh, title is realistic this year. Uh, I think eight and four on the high end, seven and five would be fair. But you know, we've talked and talked uh, about this. Anyone who's covered Michigan. For the past few years knows that the team has always had nine win talent all the time it's about coaching and getting that so we'll we'll see you know jim harbaugh talked about you know bottling up enthusiasm and unleashing it down the road we're gonna see what they have to bottle and in terms anytime you um tra transition into a new coaching staff and live bullets start to start to fly i obviously you'll be judged by your on the field product. Uh, with that said, uh, Michigan needs uh, leaders to step up, particularly because they're transitioning into a new coaching staff. So who do you look at on this roster as a, an influential leader for this year's squad? Well, I mean, it's got to be the quarterback. It's Jim. It's a Jim Harbaugh team. That's the most important position. Jim Harbaugh, you know, especially for an ex-quarterback, an ex-quarterback, you know, who is one of the greatest in Wolverines history, it has to be the quarterback's got to lead. Joe Bolden's going to be huge. Joe Bolden, senior linebacker, he's got the respect of his teammates. I loved what he did last year with driving the stake in the ground at Michigan State. I know a lot of people uh, bashed him over it. A lot of people made fun of it. I don't care. Uh, like I said, and I, and I remember Greg, Greg Madison saying, uh, Joe Bolin, give me a room full of Joe Bolins. That's exactly what they need. You love that kind of energy. Joe Bolin's intent was there from the get-go. So if they, they need to bottle that. Um, he's going to be immensely important. Desmond Morgan's going to be important. Kyle Kalis on the offensive line is going to be important. So I think there's so many players that you could point at each position group to position group, Kevin, and make a case for him being. But I think in, in terms of overall wellness, in terms of uh, the, the true gauge of this team, if the quarterback is not the leader of Michigan Wolverines, because we've seen, we've seen the problems on offense, if the quarterback is not the leader of this team this year, Michigan is not going to win many games. Now, uh, uh, traditionally, offense is, are behind defenses, particularly when you start a new coaching regime and with the uncertainty at quarterback and uh, the lack of playmakers outside on offense. How important is it for the defense to sort of carry the team as the offense finds its leg or finds its legs early in the season? Well, they, it's got to be the strength. You know, Chris Wormley said yesterday that uh, the, they regard the defensive line as the strength of this team. I, I agree. And it has been the defense has been the backbone of this team for the past two years. It's been a top 15 defense. Um, the p two years running, it finished ahead of Michigan State's defense last season, number seven and number eight ranked in total defense in FBS. So I think that, yes, it is the backbone. The secondary is the only thing that really flexed on them last year. The year before, the secondary was excellent. 
Uh, the secondary took a step back. If, if the defensive backs catch up to where the D line is, this, this defense is going to be just fantastic. Now, Harbaugh did recently say, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he wanted Michigan back at the big boys' table competing for yep. uh, championships and all that jazz. But, but we both know that it'll take Michigan uh, a couple of years to get back to the level they're accustomed to. So what do you think is the important step? I know that you said earlier that it's all about effort in, in Harbaugh's first season, but what are the steps you think the program has to take, take to get back at the big boys' table? Well, it's got to it's gotta be able to run the ball. That's that's for certain. It hasn't. Michigan hasn't had a thousand yard rusher since 2011. And that was Fitz Toussaint, and he barely got over, it, barely got more than a thousand. It was a thousand sixty four. So I think that's really the first step. And then the quarterback. I mean, we you got to have a steady pro style quarterback to really compete in the Big Ten. I I believe that. And now Ohio State can can uh, you know argue against that, but I think for the most part, you look at Russell Wilson and Wisconsin and Connor Cook at Michigan State. Uh, you know those guys have success. Uh, at least a proven system. The Michigan's kind of just shifted around and dabbled a little bit the past few years, got away from what's worked. So I think uh, reestablishing the quarterback and being able to run the ball are very important steps in in, in winning this year. And then, and as I mentioned, the offensive line. But that's a given. Those are those are three very important steps. Now you said that uh, uh, Michigan should uh, expect a seven. Uh, win or seven or eight win season if they overachieve and somehow win nine games what has to fall in place for them this season in particular to uh, rise above the mediocre level in your opinion well i think a true test i mean if they if they get cruising a little bit and build some momentum i think beating michigan state is a hurdle I don't, I don't know about beating Ohio State. I think Michigan State's probably more beatable for Michigan than Ohio State is. But then, you know, you could, argue, you could argue against that because Michigan's played some of its, you know, best games in the past two years against Ohio State. And last year's 48-28 to 28 loss, that got, didn't get away from them, you know, really until the fourth quarter. So they hung right in there. And uh, Drake Johnson, you know, was incredible. So um, I think that it, it, we'll call it this. you got to score a win over a rival. Ohio State being the last game of the year, you know, maybe that's the one. Maybe if they're sitting on eight wins and they really are striving for nine, maybe they get up for that game. But I think, you know, beating, uh, hey, winning the first game of the year never hurts either, right? So I mean, we we could talk about it. We could talk about a few games, but I I think at least you know, win your opener, beat a rival, and those are really good signs that uh, you, you might have a, a decent year. And stability is going to be really really important. So for a turnaround. So what are you seeing in terms of, of the, the dynamic between Harbaugh and uh, Jim Hackett as a working relationship? And how solid a footing do you think the Michigan program is on? I mean, I think Jim Hackett's nowhere to be seen. So he, he's doing his job. You know, Dave Brandon was out and about. Everybody knew who he was and what he was doing. Jim Hackett's, you know, signing Jordan deals. Michael Jordan's calling Jim Harbaugh. They're putting jump mans on jerseys and footballs and it's going to be awesome that's what the hardball said so i think jim hackett's in there it's his job i've long said this it's his job if he wants it i think everybody feels the same way i think that the dynamic there is that jim harbaugh certainly carries major influence um i i, I believe that jim i believe that jim harbaugh probably controls a lot more than than what we think and if, may, if maybe not controls it but Jim Harbaugh influences everything at Michigan I firmly believe that so I think uh you know him and Hackett are and we're talking about a team that finished five and seven this past season and uh you know what fired its coach and has, hasn't beaten a right beat Ohio State three times since 2000 has lost uh six of the past eight to Michigan State and yet we're still talking about Michigan like it's an elite Big Ten program or a nationally relevant program. And now it is nationally relevant only because of what's happening uh, around it. Now, you bring up national profile. Um, and obviously, when you hire Harbaugh, the national interest and in relevance of your program is going to go up 
substantially. So how do, how do you think the players are handling the, their newfound national relevance? And I realize that Michigan is a national brand, but certainly when you bring Harbaugh in, it goes to a new level. And how, how do you think ha having him as the face of the program will take some of the pressure off of the players as they begin to develop under his system? I mean, I think they like it, but at the same time, they, they see him. He's a regular guy. Jim, Jim is just a guy. He acts like himself. I mean, I, I think the more we see him, I don't know him personally. I'm just, you know, gauging what I see, his personality, he's a regular guy. I mean, he really is. The players say that. I think that they are going to enjoy playing for him. I think that, you know, winning is going to make everything a lot sweeter. So, I mean, that's got to be bar none. You have to win games. Then this can be fun, but the, there's business to take care of before you start having fun. I I think that the uh, the spotlight being on him is a good thing, because especially if it isn't, if the season doesn't uh, turn out the way that they want it, then it'll be more of on the coach. What did Jim Harbaugh not do to prepare these guys, as opposed to what did the players not do to win games for Coach Harbaugh? So I think I think either way, he's got it set up to where it's going to fall on him, and he wants that. I mean he. Jim Harbaugh is Michigan football. He's going to show that this year, no matter what their record is. My question for you is just an overall question about the Big Ten Conference as a whole. How do you see that shaking out this year? Ohio State. <laughs> Ohio State. Uh, I, think Ohio, I think Ohio State is the best team in the country. Last year, I didn't think Ohio State. Um, I, did not, I did not put them you know, in my top four for college football playoff. I guess I was wrong about them, but... Um, not that they weren't a good team, I just didn't see, you know, when you're stacking up some of the other resumes. But I think Ohio State this season, bar none, the best team in, in college football. I think Big Ten. I think Michigan State will be decent. Like I mentioned, I think I think Minnesota could win nine games this year. I mean, Minnesota Minnesota might be a team to watch. And uh, you know what? As far as the Big Ten as as a whole is concerned, it's you know people talk about the East, but watch the West too. I mean, Nebraska. Nebraska might have something up its sleeve. It's just it's so early and it well, yet it's so close and it's we think we have so many ideas. This is the beauty of college football and, and anything that we think may happen could be the total opposite of what really happens. And a guy that we've never even heard of may emerge and just become you know a big a big time a big time player. So that is the beauty of college football and it's and it's the beauty of being you know what we're uh, six days away from from kickoff. Uh, for most teams, so it's a it's a very exciting time. Adam, have fun covering Michigan football this year, and we thank you for joining us again on the Two Man Advantage podcast, buddy. No problem, Kevin. Anytime, man.